welcome to a special edition of The Rest is Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. We are very, very fortunate because we have managed to, having had so far two guests, Tony Blair and Keir Starmer, quite rightly, people are pointing out that we're not covering the full political spectrum. So we are very, very fortunate today to have somebody I admire immensely, who is William Hague, who um, anybody who is listening ought to have a good sense of who he is. But he was, of course, the British Foreign Secretary. And he was the leader of the Conservative Party, in fact, when uh, Alistair Campbell was working with Tony Blair. And he is with us today. Um, Now, let, let me just start maybe by giving Alistair a chance to reflect a little bit on the more distant days of Tony Blair and William Hague and Prime Minister's questions. And because obviously William Hague was, <laughs> was, was standing opposite Tony Blair across that dispatch box. William, thank you very, very much for joining us. We're very grateful. But I do want to start with those wonderful days when it felt like Labour were going to be in power forever. Uh, we had a huge three figure majority and week in, week out, you came along and landed a few blows on Tony Blair. But then come the election thereafter, we had another three-figure majority. And I guess what I'd like to start off with is, is we talk a lot on this podcast about the kind of psychology of leadership and, and how you feel. And I, I just want to know, did you ever – what did it feel like when you were up against Tony Blair in his pomp? Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting opening uh, Hello, Rory. Hello, Alistair. Uh, great pleasure to, to join you. Um, it felt pretty good when I was at the dispatch box against it, because then, as you know, that was the one time, really, that I felt I was on equal terms uh, with him. Or it was in my own environment, may, maybe on more than equal terms, uh, because I had nothing else going for me at all, as uh, as <laughs> Alistair will very well recall. And indeed, you were making it your business to make sure I never got anything going for me at all. So whenever I stepped outside the House of Commons, it was pretty hopeless. Um, but there was this one, okay, once a week, I could raise morale on my own side and do what I enjoy doing anyway. And I could sense that Tony Blair, he didn't enjoy it, really, the cut and thrust of the House of Commons. He was a brilliant operator at so many things, but he didn't really thrive on that, did he? I mean, you, you must have seen that, Alistair. Well, I think he took, it, he took it incredibly seriously. I never saw him not nervous before PMQs. I think you probably know he, he had various superstitions. He had this little red ribbon that he had in his pocket. He, he always wore the same shoes and he polished them every Wednesday morning. Uh, for the entire time that he was prime minister. Uh, I do think, I have to say, I'm not just saying this because you're here. We've talked, he and I have talked about this a lot. He, I think he felt you were the best at PMQs that he, that he faced. But I do think we eventually got to this point with you where you, you were so funny that we thought we had to disable your wit. Uh, we, we started to run this line against you that you were great at the jokes, but bad at judgment. And then we started calling you the bandwagon man and you stopped being as funny. And we were very, very happy when you stopped being <laughs> quite as funny as you had been. <laughs> no, I think that was quite effective. I take my hat off to you as in, in so many ways. I think that was pretty effective as a tactic because we, we did, you know, I used to have in mind the late John Smith. I wrote the, the, one of the Labour leaders I've most admired in my life was, was John Smith, who, when he was leader of the opposition, used to make us laugh at ourselves on the conservative side. Yeah. You know, he once yeah. did like a neighbor's sketch about Margaret Thatcher and Nigel Lawson in number 10 11. And we were all cracking up on the conservative side, even though we weren't meant to. And I always had him in mind when I was opposite Tony Blair. How do I make the Labour Party with all this strength, with these 400 MPs, how do we make them laugh at themselves and their own leader? So that's why I used to come up. I used to give a lot of work to these, you know, these spontaneous one line. You know, when I used to say, well, if he was having such problems with the job of London mayor, why didn't he just split the job and have Frank Dobson as his day mayor and Ken Livingstone as his nightmare? Uh, and uh, and <laughs> the Labour good. Party would laugh. And Tony Blair would laugh. But as you, as you were saying, Alice, it didn't do me any good in the long term. You know, the general election was no different. However, think what it would have been like if I hadn't been doing that. I did at least in this in these days of um, leadership uh, votes of no confidence and leadership challenges and so on. I did get through that four years with the Conservative Party solidly behind me. You know, they, they didn't know what was going to happen to them, but they did stick with me 
And I think that was one of the reasons, actually, that at least on the floor of the House of Commons, we could still beat up the other side. William, can I, can I come in on, on this for a second? I'm very interested in the role that debate does or doesn't play now. And it strikes me that something is changing. So in the 19th century, people put an incredible amount of energy into their speeches in the House of Commons. People competed for seats to watch them. They would quote their one-liners, almost like musical songs. And I believe Disraeli ran the government from the House of Commons. I mean, he was there in the chamber a lot with his dispatch box, doing his papers. And he really felt he needed to run the whole thing from inside the chamber. By the time I got into Parliament, much later than you, in 2010, I felt that very few MPs were putting much energy into their speeches. They were writing them pretty quickly. They were reading them out. A lot of people were sitting watching their phones. And I wondered in a sense whether actually part of this wasn't the fact the whole thing had been televised. So people weren't really addressing each other anymore. They were just trying to get a little clip that they could put on social media or for people back home. And any thoughts on how what changed, how things changed over time? Well, I don't think it's televising the House of Commons that changed. I was there at the end of it not being televised. I actually voted one of my first votes in uh, 1989 to televise the House of Commons. And I don't think that took away from debate. In fact, those Prime Minister's questions exchanges we were just talking about, it made it meant a lot to me that that was on television, that people could see that I could, uh, you know, stick up for myself. Including in the United States. Oh, I know. Oh, people in the United States, even now, if I get into a taxi in New York, they are talking about that. Uh, mm. You know, uh, David Cameron laughs about how somebody said in America, I love your show. Uh, which is which is prime minister's <laughs> questions, and can you imagine an American president subjecting themselves to this in Congress every week? I mean, it would be uh, they wouldn't have a chance, actually. Um, recent presidents, but um, sorry, I'm off. I'm off Rory's point. It was just, so this change, change over time from the 19th century to the yes, no, it's a huge change because remember, in the back in the days of Israeli or Pitt, my hero. But the budget, you know, they'd present the budget for four or five hours in the House of Commons. But that was it. If you didn't hear it then, you didn't you didn't get to know what was in the budget, right? This was the explanation of it. It wasn't all repeated on some television news afterwards. And I think it's the proliferation of other news outlets, and then in particular the rise of social media, um, which has reduced things to, you know, as in Twitter, to the 140 characters or 280 characters. And we need to get debate back to the longer form discussion, which is actually where you guys come in. This is where podcasts now come in. This is why mm. I've agreed to subject myself to your, you know, your your scrutiny or teasing or whatever. One more geeky thing just before, before I let Alistair come in on more contemporary politics, but on, on this historical point, because I do think it, there's something really interesting about this, because obviously the word parliament literally in French means talking shop. And the center of it all was a debating chamber. And that goes all the way back to the Roman Senate. But I felt when I was an MP that it was an empty, hollow shell, that it very rarely mattered at all. And one of the reasons for that is I felt that we'd lost our confidence in being able to persuade. And I have an instinct that in the 19th century, even though whips existed, even though people voted on party lines, there was still more of a possibility that a speech in the House of Commons could have an impact. The government might not admit it at the time. They might pretend at the time that a really powerful speech from the opposition was irrelevant to them. But the whole series of backroom maneuvers and ways of doing compromises, which meant that it was worth making your arguments, that they could actually change things. Yes, I, I completely agree. And this is why, um, actually, these days, debate in the House of Lords, for all the criticism I get, is, is often of a higher quality than in the House of Commons, because you can make a difference to the outcome. The, the members, uh, you know, a large proportion of the members don't assume they're going to have to vote for their party, uh, which is the case in the House of Commons. I think the House of Commons still has its moments, though. I, um, you were there, Rory, when I wasn't in the, um, in the whole, in the Brexit, there those endless uh, votes and maneuvers about Brexit in the, uh, through Theresa May's premiership. And there the House of Commons did recover some of its 
role and you didn't always know what the outcome of a vote was going to be so it depends mm. it's more in the time of big majority governments that it withers away i think no i i can remember as a journalist though i think a lot of this is about the way the media's changed i can remember as a journalist sitting in my office in the daily mirror and when the annunciator came on and there were certain names that when it went bong and a name came up you felt you had to go and hear what they said. And also most journalists back then, myself included, would start the day sort of flicking through the day before's Hansard. I think the big change now is that journalists have to cover so many different things on a given day. They have to blog, they have to tweet, they have to do their Instagram posts and all the rest of it. And I don't think they have any time really for the debates. And I think that's influenced the politicians way more than it should have done. I think the politicians have been influenced too much by the way the media cover politics. But it's also, remember, the often the way the politicians succeed is through those same social media channels. You know, as, as we know, in more in recent elections, it's really winning that war on mm. those social media and the Facebook and so on that counts for much more uh, mm. than having a, um, you know, having some triumph in a televised debate uh, quite a mm. long time, let alone in Parliament. So I think social media has changed a lot of this, but uh, we have to get back to the big, you know, the, the long discussion. I really wish the network channels on television would go back to having the extensive interview. You know, that even in my day, sound like I sound really old now, I used to sit on On the Record with John Humphreys on a Sunday mm -hmm. lunchtime with, for like 50 minutes of an interview. Um, and party leaders don't have to subject themselves to that. But, they, but, but partly because they don't have to. Boris Johnson avoids yes. being interviewed because he can just do his stuff on his own channels. Right. No, well, it, exactly. So it's back to the same point. But I think it's, it's incumbent upon broadcasters to try to bring that back mm. because then, mm. the, okay, not many people want to watch that, but uh, to those who do, it is a far more searching scrutiny. Uh, than you get in a lot of today's media, or even than a hustings in the, with the party faithful. You, you, you mentioned the quality of debate in the House of Lords there. Can I ask you what you think of, if it is true, which we believe it is, that Boris Johnson wants to pack 50 peers, including a few Russians, it seems, into the House of Lords on the condition that they vote for everything the government proposes, given that he hasn't even been able to fulfill a full term and he's being hounded out of office in disgrace. Well, I wouldn't approve of that at all. I don't approve of adding any more Lords to the Lord. By the way, I'm doing my bit by I've taken leave of absence from the House of Lords. I'm so uh, this is because I'm so busy with the things I do in business and charity and writing worlds. Um, but I, I don't approve of uh, adding more at the moment to what is too big a house. But I particularly wouldn't approve of this sort of, uh, I don't know whether it's true, but yeah, there is this rumored uh, kind of contract where, you know, we won't vote against the party if you make us a lord. It's totally unenforceable, by the way, because mm. when you get into the House of Lords, you're there for life and you can do what you want. Do you think it's corrupt? <sighs> well, it's, um, since it's unenforceable, Maybe not technically, but it, it's not right. It's not right. It, it's completely against the spirit of it, which is that you go to exercise your own judgment, even if you take a party whip uh, mm. in the House of Lords. So, no, I, I would strongly disapprove of anything like that. But I disapprove anyway of adding dozens more peers. This needs to, be, to have any chance of working properly. It needs to be a smaller house. If you think back to when you were leader of the Conservative Party, a couple of decades ago now, how do you think we've got from where we were then, where, I mean, maybe I, I did at least feel that we had two serious parties. We had, I did think debate was kind of reasonable. And we do now appear to have inf been infected with the populist virus every bit as much as some of the other countries that have. I mean, how, what's your own assessment of how the last two decades have gone and how we've ended up where we are? Well, yes, it is a striking change how similar we were. Of course, one of my problems against Tony Blair was now when you see it in historical perspective, we didn't disagree over that much, uh, really. You know, it was a terrible time to be an opposition leader. I could have done with some really big disagreement. But, you know, really, I was going to have taxes fractionally lower than Tony Blair, and he was going to have spending a tiny bit higher. Um, and I was against joining the euro, and he wasn't going to join it anyway. Yeah, Gordon was making sure of that. 
Yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. We, we had Gordon Brown to rely on. Um, and so um, the difference as well, that he, uh, when, when I listen to Tony Blair now, actually he, his and my views are quite similar. Really. Now, our part, both parties have changed dramatically in mm. that time. Um, now, why is that? Well, again, I, I'm not going to harp on all the time about social media, but the means of communication have changed. That's partly facilitated uh, populism. But then there's also been this um, a certain emptiness, hasn't there, in liberal democracy of, uh, well, now we've done everything. You know, we won the Cold War and we had a growing economy um, and we had globalization arrived at the, at the turn of the century. So everything that we'd always wanted had happened. And yet there was still a lot of people restless, unhappy, you know, inequality growing and then a global financial crisis and immigration taking off. And so what else, what else were we going to offer people? Uh, and I think those of us in the sort of more in the center of, uh, um, center right or center left of politics didn't then have the compelling new thing that we mm. were going on to. Whereas Jeremy Corbyn or Donald Trump or Nigel Farage have had some compelling new things. I wouldn't be too bleak about this though, because notice in Britain how the, the main political parties have come much closer back together again. You know, their, their economic policies aren't that far apart. The Labour Party, you know, you had Keir Starmer on recently, wants to make a success of Brexit now. So they're actually starting to converge again, aren't they, the main political parties? Oh, Lord. <laughs> that's really upset, Alistair, that thought. It's really, it's, yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it horrifies him. It really horrifies him. He does not, uh, you would uh, pick up, uh, remotely agree that Keir Starmer should be um, uh, taking this line on Brexit. Um, one of the things that we've talked about and we talked about when we interviewed Tony Blair, was the decision uh, back in the day to lean into globalization. So both uh, Tony Blair's government and to some extent Gordon Brown and David Cameron and you when you were foreign secretary were at a period where it felt like the world was about getting closer to Russia, closer to China. And of course, we're now in a world where we feel the reverse and where people like Angela Merkel, the, the German chancellor, has now been really criticized for getting too close to Russia. Um, I wonder whether I could give you a chance to explain what people were thinking at the time, whether you feel that it's possible to make a defense for Angela Merkel, whether we got it wrong, how we got it wrong, what the lessons are. Well, I think it is possible to make a defense because you know, just because we can look back and see what has happened doesn't mean that it was inevitable. And that we could have known that this was what was going to happen. You know, history does often turn on um, to a to a much greater degree, I think, than people realize outside government on the decisions of powerful individuals. You know, it, of course, there are great uh, social and economic and demographic forces driving the world, but individuals make extraordinary decisions and turning points in history. And that's particularly true where somebody gets in sole charge of a country. So China, we can now see, is going in a direction we don't like, that isn't great for our interests, that isn't good for globalization. It's going in a more Marxist, Leninist party control direction. It's, it, it's subjugating human rights in Hong Kong. It's building up a much bigger nuclear force. But... We couldn't have assumed that 10 years ago, could we? We had to hope it was going in a direction of a, uh, that ju just like the Soviet Union, it would go in a more uh, liberal direction. It would go politically, more, a Gorbachev sort of direction. So we had to hope that, and a lot has turned on Xi Jinping's own decisions here. You, you're right. There was that, that argument. Against that, you'd say, but the problem with that, the downside of gambling on hope is that we became very, very dependent on the Chinese economy for goods and the Russian economy for energy. And that the problem with gambling that we could have a detente with China is that it had a real impact on our resilience. We didn't develop alternative networks. We've ended up in a world where 90% of the advanced semiconductor chips are made in Taiwan, which are now very vulnerable, where our dependence on rare earths is immense on China. So I suppose the question would be, why didn't we at the time feel 
okay, by all means, let's be friendly or try gamble that we may be able to have a sort of rapprochement with these guys, but at the same time, invest in our resilience, make sure that we have alternatives, that we're not totally running down our industrial production, etc. Yes, I agree with that too. Of course, being friendly and trying a strategic um, partnership with the country does not mean you should make yourself dependent on them. And the first time I met Putin uh, with David Cameron in the Kremlin, 2011, Almost the entire meeting was him trying to sell us gas. He was trying. He wanted to build a pipeline to Britain. And uh, you, it's understandable from his point of view. This is when the Germans were agreeing to Nord Stream 2. So I'm not in the same school as all the way as Angela Merkel here. And uh, he had this all worked out. It was going to come down the Baltic. I, somehow under Denmark and across the North Sea, he could draw it out. You know, and uh, we didn't even have to confer or look at our notes. So this is not a good idea. We do want to improve relations with Russia at that point, but we, we were not going to make ourselves dependent on Putin's gas. So actually, we were approaching it in the way you were just describing. Uh, on why were we trying to improve relations with Russia? Well, it's not in the interests of the Western world strategically for Russia and China to be teamed up together and to push uh, to have them in the same corner. And so obviously, it, it, it is, it's better on that great chessboard of geopolitics if you can separate them. Now, they're not due to circumstances beyond our control. They are now driven together, or they've come together themselves. Mm -hmm. But it was at least right to try to have uh, to detach Russia from that, um, from that trajectory. Am I right that you were at the handover, the Hong Kong handover? Yes, when, um, which, I mean, I don't know what your memories of that are. My memories of that are very much of thinking, this feels very, very strange and quite dark. I can remember us being dragged over, the, the Chinese insisting that even though Tony Blair was prime minister and this was meant to be at that stage still our territory, that we had to sort of go and see them. And it was a very difficult meeting. If you remember, the weather was horrible. It was all a bit mm -hmm. wild. And it just felt, and I just remember thinking thereafter, whenever, when I saw, Osborne and Cameron doing the big reset, as it were. I do, this isn't hindsight, I do remember thinking this feels quite naive to me, that these guys are going to take a lot here and give very little. Yeah, now I think, um, now here I have to explain, I left as Foreign Secretary in 2014, and this yeah. sort of golden age with China was proclaimed after that. And, and actually there, there were a couple of sort of... Um, uh, breaks in the coalition government being applied to uh, total enthusiasm for China. Uh, one was me and one was Nick Clegg, actually. Nick Clegg mm. more on human rights grounds uh, and me on balance of power in Asia Pacific. I, I spent a lot of time uh, as Foreign Secretary on relations with Japan, South Korea, Australia, the Philippines, etc. Um, Vietnam, um, building up our relations with the rest of the Asia Pacific. I do think then that uh, the government got too carried away with the China golden age. So I accept all of those um, criticisms, actually. Um, but now, you know, now the situation is actually much clearer and we have a much mm. bigger problem, which is we are heading for a confrontation with China uh, over time. And so now we have to work out how to, uh, how both sides avert that. Right, we'll take a very, very short break and we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. Uh, we're here with our special guest, William Haig. Uh, Rory, where do you want to take this next? Well, William, can I just come in on your resignation as Foreign Secretary? Because that's something that always really puzzled me. There you were, you were Foreign Secretary, which has always seemed to me to be the one job certainly I would like in British government. That's an advert mistrust, if you're listening. That was Rory Stewart. <laughs> happy to do it from the House of Lords. <laughs> so you could have remained almost forever. I mean, you, you, you almost certainly could have gone through 2015. You probably could have been Foreign Secretary for 10, 12 years. Um, and you chose after four years to step down. And I remember talking to you at the time and you were getting frustrated. You were getting frustrated with the fact that you felt that a lot of your job, or maybe I'm being unfair, but I seem to remember you suggesting that you were getting frustrated with the amount of time you felt that you were doing spending, uh, selling uh, British defense equipment around the world, that you weren't feeling that you were really getting on with uh, the number of foreign policy. But I also felt there was something very depressing for me as a young MP to think, here's this guy who's made it right the way to the top of the tree and is voluntarily deciding 
that he's going to go and do other things with his life. Whereas in the, again, my be- beloved 19th century, you would have stuck there like Gladstone till the very end. <laughs> well, several things here. Um, one is that very few people get out of politics and they're on their own timing, on their own terms. And um, I always wanted to do that. But that means you have to go before every, almost anybody wants you to go. Secondly, I think there is some limit to how long you can do the same portfolio. You know, and, and um, I became shadow foreign secretary back in 2005. So I had nearly five years in opposition doing the foreign policy. And then, you know, foreign secretary for a slightly more than four years. So I was nine, I was more than nine years into that of relentless travel. And you think, well, I'm going to lose my edge before too long. So I think there is that. The other thing, on an entirely personal basis, is when I quit as leader of the opposition in 2001, uh, when, when Alistair had uh, routed me uh, successfully in that election, I discovered it wasn't the be all and end all in politics. I really loved writing books, uh, writing newspaper columns, being back in the business world a bit, having some free time. Um, I really enjoyed it. So when David Cameron became the leader of the Conservative Party, I thought, right, well, now we've got a sensible leader. I will offer to come back, but for 10 years. And I told him in 2005, I will give you 10 years. And in 2014, I said, right, that's nine. So now I want to go. In one year's time, I'll do lead for the House of Commons on the way out because I want to get back to all these other things um, that I was doing. And not people sometimes find it hard to believe that a politician isn't just so obsessed with politics that they never want to do anything else. Some are like Gladstone or Ken Clark or something, you know, who will always carry on. But I'm not like that. I think politics is one fascinating thing in life, but it's not the only thing in life. Just on David Cameron, William, did you, did you? I've argued with him about this quite a lot. F- frankly, every time I see him, did you go along with his assessment that he had to have the referendum? Yes, I did. Yes, I was part of that assessment. To be uh, uh, several of us were part of that assessment um, because I think the there was a major problem in the Conservative Party as well as the rise of UKIP. I think when you, if you think of the 2015 election, I spent much of that election in these conservative UKIP battlegrounds down the Kent coast and the, the east coast of the country generally. And the conservatives would have lost quite a few of those seats without the referendum coming. So then they would have had a minority government with a strong UKIP contingent in parliament. We would have ended up having a referendum. I mean, I think the, uh, here I have a, a sort of bone to pick with, well, with, uh, with either you or Tony Blair or Gordon Brown. I think the failure to have a referendum on the, what became the Lisbon Treaty um, and, and, and the signing up to uncontrolled immigration earlier than necessary from the new EU states ultimately created the irresistible demand on the Conservative Party to have a referendum on EU membership. If we'd had one on the Lisbon Treaty, we would never have had Brexit in the end. Mm. And do you think we'd have won that referendum if we'd had it? No, I think the, well, probably not. I don't know. But probably the people of Britain would have voted against the Lisbon Treaty. That would have complicated our relations with the EU. They would have thought of some um, diluted treaty to pass instead. But we would we would then have, have uh, exerted our influence within the EU, and the question of a referendum to leave or stay would never have become mm. so strong. So I think it was cutting people out of decisions about Europe over a long period that then led to Brexit, not some sort of last minute error by David Cameron. How do you feel about Brexit and the way it's playing, the way it's panning out now? I don't think it's going very well. Um, you know, I was a Eurosceptic. As you know, at the time we were sparring, I was the sort of, I was the Eurosceptic end of politics. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, but on the basis of, you know, my slogan, my one successful slogan when I was, when I won the European elections uh, against you guys was uh, in Europe, but not run by Europe. And that yeah. was always my position in a nutshell. I wish, I wish that was the position now. Yes. Um, and uh, now, the, so I've stayed the same. The whole political spectrum has gone past me, so that I'm now a kind of in the soggy centre of uh, <laughs> of politics and, and the sort of left wing end of the Conservative Party. Because it's I haven't changed. 
everything has gone past me. And um, I think that, uh, I don't think it's going very well. I think we've lost some trade. I think uh, we've lost quite a lot of business investment. But here I am with that Keir Starmer speech of a few weeks ago. There's no going back on it. Uh, and the question is how to make the best of it. And the, the surprising thing so far is we haven't done better at making the best of it. Isn't that because in this populist era, those who are in charge refuse to admit that anything isn't going well, up to and including the, the Northern Ireland Protocol? Well, maybe, but it's also making government get down to nitty gritty detail. Um, I've written in my column in The Times this week about uh, how we become a science superpower, you know, which is the slogan. But it won't be a reality unless you really get down to lots of nitty gritty about having the lab technicians, about having the mm. best regulations in the world on artificial intelligence and other things about making the visas uh, for scientists as affordable as, the, as, as in other countries. They have to really get down and master the detail in order to make a success of Brexit. And I think that's what hasn't happened yet. This is the theme, isn't it, in governance, which is a, a really troubling thing, isn't it? Because, of course, the new style of politics, whether you call it populist or simply contemporary politics of the 24-hour campaign, is all about winning elections generally by being very black and white, partisan, simplifying. And that develops habits of mind which are not very suited to nitty-gritty, complexity, critical thinking when you get back into the cabinet room. And, and I felt this very much with Boris Johnson. He kind of masterful at the kind of big public campaign, but really, really had an attention deficit disorder. He, he got very bored if you tried to talk to him about the details of how things got done. And I, I'm really struck by this because all the way from, and I, I did this conference with Tony Blair, where we were trying to talk about the center ground of British politics and how to build it. And as you can imagine, Everybody stood up and we all cheerfully talked about how we need to think about climate, we need to think about technology, we need to think about productivity. And then you see Rishi Sunak standing up and saying he's going to bring us growth through investment and innovation and education. And, and the point is, we've been saying this for 30 years or more. And the fact is, our productivity is still pretty rubbish and our growth is not that impressive. So what's the problem here? How come all the think tanks, all the articles and the economists or the Financial Times all agree on what we need to do and have been saying the same thing for 30 years, but it never happens? Well, I think there's, uh, I, I agree with you on your criticism of politics as a performance. I, I suppose Trump is the ultimate case in this. But Boris Johnson had tendencies of this as well. Uh, we do, it's a show that must go on, you know, and that requires, you constantly have to feed the audience with the controversy or the amusement and that's what the focus on rather than delivery when you think how many how the everybody changed in the trump administration every six months um and we've had some of that here I, again i've been making the point this week we've had four science ministers in three years well you know you can't deliver uh if you do that so there is that but of course there's something else isn't there when you say uh, you're quite right about how we've had all these think tanks and we all say what should be done but we just haven't managed between governments to really tackle some deep-seated things, such as education uh, in this country. Lots of governments have focused on that. Um, Tony Blair did with Alistair. But, you know, we haven't really cracked that. And it's very difficult for policy. That is the key to leveling up. Let's just talk through education. What, what, what are the things that make it difficult? I think it, it, it's very difficult because um, you have a lot of vested interest. You have teaching unions, for instance, uh, who don't necessarily like radical change. You have private schools. <laughs> well, okay, let's take that, although many of those are very good, of course, and many state yeah, schools like the ones I went to. But you also have, it's it's very hard to keep education up with the modern world. And you think how dramatically now technology is changing and how amazingly we could revolutionize educational techniques, you know, tailored to the individual uh, child, the individual learner. But that would mean completely reinventing the model of how you do classroom uh, education. That's so hard. Uh, mm. You can get it wrong. Yes, unions would be against it. Various educational experts would say it was wrong. Um, it's a huge bureaucracy to turn around. You can see how this is very 
difficult, but it, it's the failure to tackle one or two really crucial, fundamental building blocks of a more productive and uh, uh, society and economy that is our problem, I think, in this country. William, you, you mentioned your Times column a few times, and I read your column a few weeks ago now where you were giving some gentle advice to Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss, whoever wins, and I think it is going to be Liz Truss. I know you're backing Sunak. Um, but you were basically saying you felt they should pretty quickly divorce themselves from any idea that Boris Johnson should kind of hang around. I mean, what's your assessment of his premiership, of his leadership of the Conservative Party, and what his successor should do? Because it always struck me that you were very good at not causing trouble for your successor. Uh, your successors. Others have been, I think, the whole Thatcher Heath story. We lived through that. Um, but what's your sense of, of of how they should handle Boris Johnson once he's once they're in Downing Street and he's out? Yeah, well, I was alerting them in the column to the fact this is going to be a problem. Whoever wins, uh, you know, that even for Liz Truss, who was who was loyal to Boris, I was pointing out that there aren't any prime ministers in history who've been enthusiastic about their successor. And I'm sure that applies to the one you work for, uh, Alistair. He, he didn't look that interesting. I work for them both, William. I work for them both. <laughs> okay, well, the, the one, the main one that you work for, uh, and, and, and and that's going to be true of uh, of a particularly of this performance point because the Boris performance is going to the show is going to have to go on, right? And that is going to mean writing things and saying things that upset the the new prime minister. So I'm I was saying first of all we'll get ready for that um and secondly just they they have to just not entertain the idea that he can come back you know that he should be a an influential figure in the party again i was really saying we like theresa may when she um refused to applaud boris when he left the last pmqs we stand out of respect for the office but we don't applaud anymore just don't encourage him um mm. and, and the, the whole party has to do that. It strikes me that Liz Truss is encouraging him. She's finding it very hard to say a critical word. She hasn't encouraged the idea he could serve in her government if she wins. He thinks he can come back, I'm sure. He thinks he's, he's Berlusconi. Well, he might well think, and that is where everybody, even though even those who are his real friends, have to disabuse him of that, because no one can say it worked out very well. You know, to be hounded from office by your own party, not over policy, but over the conduct of government is mm. something unprecedented in our country in modern times. Mm. And his friends have to say, look, that is, let's the, that's the honest truth of what's happened. And there's Bor Boris has a great gift for writing, a passion for nature, a love of history. Think what a great life he could have if he just said, what the hell with all of that politics? I'm going to do the other things uh, that I enjoy. And um, he would be far less irritating to his successors. They have to try and steer him down that path, Some probably impossible. So they're probably doomed to, to have him causing mayhem on a regular basis. Mm. As we come to the end, you've been very generous with your time, but l let me just um, get, get back onto one thing that we talk about a lot, which is the future of the world economy. I'm very concerned that we have a high chance that we're going to go into a 10-year recession, that it's going to feel like the 1970s, and that there are big reasons for that. One of them is demography. We're just getting older population. We're not really replacing bringing young people. I think cost of production is going to soar. I think inflation is going to go up. And I think that central banks are going to be reluctant to respond. But I'd, I'd like to just, and, and therefore I feel a bit queasy when I see everybody, understandably all these leadership candidates and indeed Keir Starmer, all promising that somehow they're going to be able to resolve all these issues and generate growth. I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful about that. I'm a bit more gloomy, but I'd, I'd love to hear you on that. And then I'll hand back to Alistair and maybe we're heading towards an end. Well, look, you've got, you can't stand for election to lead a major country unless you have some optimism in it. So, um, you know, that, that, <laughs> Rory, if, let me advise you that if you, if you come to that situation, you're definitely going to have to say, we can get through these problems. We can do it together. Britain can succeed. William, William I, tr <laughs> I try to, I try to toughen Rory up as a politician. Rory, I don't think you should go into campaigns say, what do we want? 10 year global recession. When do we want it now? It's just not a good slogan. No, no, you can't. You, you know, you have to say, well, things are bad, and I do actually. I do think that to offer some correct, uh, to half agree with you, political leaders do need to say 
how bad things are going to be, you know, how tough it's going to be for mm. to, to, to support Ukraine over the coming winter. Um, it, and to really show people that is worthwhile. They do have to say, we will have to make sacrifices. Um, but there's a reason for that. You, you, they have to prepare people for difficult times. Um, but then you do have to show, as a, uh, you, to, you know, you, you've got to show how we can get through that. And actually, we can't. The, the one thing to cling on to in this, in the wave of pessimism of which Rory is a uh, is, is part, and which is can, can easily be justified, um, is human ingenuity is extraordinary. You know, think of the pandemic we've just been through and how rapidly vaccines were produced and a totally astonishing thing. And then billions of people uh, vaccinated. Um, and what a situation we would have been in if that hadn't been scientifically and administratively possible. So um, never underestimate our own ingenuity. And uh, that's what innovation and, uh, and making the most of that is the is the the one bright spot in this pretty gloomy world at the moment? Mm, mm. And on the technology stuff, you, you, it sounds to me like you're, this is another place where you're in very similar quarters to Tony Blair, who's obsessed with this idea that sort of the solution to these problems will will find itself in technology and and innovation. But but then I've just been listening to the extraordinary German podcast series about China and technology and China and the internet. And it's frankly, slightly terrified me because it makes me think that they are way ahead even of where we think they are. And they're using it in a way that maybe we would not necessarily approve of. So how do you also persuade people that technology can provide the solutions without actually making things even worse than they are? Oh, vast subject. Um, I think you have to point to the breakthroughs. You know, well, think something people can understand is, again, on the medical side, if you look at artificial intelligence, I think the biggest thing happening in the world alongside climate change today is the rise of artificial intelligence. And there are great dangers in that, you know, weapons controlled by artificial intelligence in the future. But the upside potential, the anti, the new antibiotics that can be discovered by AI, the, the, the comprehensive understanding of proteins that AI is now generating that would have taken decades otherwise means that we are in for the greatest leaps forward in medicine in the next decade that we've ever seen in the whole history of human civilization. So, you know, that sh think of that prize and what difference it will make to the quality of life for people. Um, and, and that ought to inspire people to really concentrate on these things, to go into these careers. And we ought to be able to align our universities and our education system with making that exciting for people. Well, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, thank you for coming on. It's been a great pleasure to talk to you both. Yeah, I hope it wasn't painful. We try, we try, we try and be nice to our guests, um, even when they're Tories. Although it strikes me that you're becoming <laughs> less and less of a Tory, William. I'm getting that feeling with this. <laughs> now, or, or maybe you... you're becoming more of one. No, I'm like you, <laughs> William. I've never changed my views really about anything. <laughs> but it's been very good talking to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you again, William, very much. And bye-bye. Bye. Well done, Rory. I, I thoroughly enjoyed talking to William Haig. Well, thank you for playing along. Um, just quickly, Alice, I mean, you know, obviously I, at the last one, was a bit sceptical about some of the stuff. What, what would you say the kind of ups and downs of that were? Well, it's obviously very different when you're talking to somebody like Keir Starmer, who's, who's, who's current and active and trying to become the next prime minister. I mean, what I found interesting, and I always thought Haig was a very interesting character and thoughtful. But I, funny enough, when I talked to Tony Blair, I, I, I spoke to Tony yesterday. He said, you know, we were going to be talking to William Haig on the podcast. And Tony said something quite interesting. He said he thought Haig was really intelligent, really smart, but he, but he felt that maybe when he was leader of the Conservative Party, he wasn't a fully formed politician in the way that he is now, but he's out of politics. And what I felt was interesting was that he, you know, I thought, for example, we didn't have much time on it, but when we were talking there about science and technology and artificial intelligence, he's still obviously really thinking about this stuff in a way that when he was active on the front line in politics, 
he was probably thinking less because he was, as you say, campaigning, fighting, trying to overturn this sort of beer moth that he obviously felt we, you know, we were a bit unbeatable at the time. I mean, he was, he was also, I mean, crazily young. He was 36 years old. And he'd been, um, I think, I mean, it's unfair to him, but I think he was just, had been in the cabinet as the Secretary of State for Wales. So it was a very, very rapid thing. It must have been a huge amount of pressure hitting him in that way. Um, I, I do think, I mean, it's something for us to, to talk about more, and I'd love to hear more from listeners. My instinct is that sometimes it is a bit more interesting getting people who aren't serving politicians. I think we need a few serving politicians on, but I tend to find them pretty boring because I think they are very limited in what they can say, sometimes for good reasons, as you, as we were discussing in that, this whole point about them having to sound optimistic, having to sound as though they've got all the answers, doesn't really allow them to step back and say, mm. you know, we're screwed, or I don't know what's going on, or I don't really... So I, I'm, it'd be, be, be interesting to see how listeners react. And But my, my instinct is that I usually get a bit bored and frustrated by people who are still in office, whereas some of those people who've left, I think, can be more thoughtful about politics in general. Even from the limited shot of his book, she's extraordinary uh, tidy bookshelf. And he, and he gave us a little tour on the laptop of his entire library where he was sitting. He's a very, he reads a lot of books and he studies a lot of stuff. And he's, I, I also found, I mean, I do think that I, I was, I really enjoyed the first few minutes there talking about how we got the better of him over time in in Prime Minister's questions, because there was definitely a point where Tony Blair was getting a bit worried that, William Hague was 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 having too many points victories at Prime Minister's questions. And Tony did. P- people used to say Tony didn't take Parliament seriously because of the size of our majority. He really did take Parliament seriously. And so did I, because we saw those Prime Minister's questions exchanges as the kind of strategic anvil where we were working out what are the lines of attack that work best? What are the lines of defence that work best? What are the things that we can say here that are also going to connect with the public? And William Hague was a very good tester of what we were trying to do and I'm so glad that he accepted that we knocked him off course with his <laughs> with, his, <laughs> with the jokes not judgment attack I, I guess the final thing is it's very striking how British politics and the leadership doesn't talk about artificial intelligence doesn't talk about quantum computing doesn't really talk about robotics and the way in which this is changing the world and it's been true I mean obviously the, the world in general people outside politics have been focused on these things for, for decades. And it's transforming every aspect of our life. And it's really weird that we mm. have a politics that spends so little time trying to address technology. But I guess it's just difficult to make it appealing to voters. It can sound a bit geeky. I mean, I, I thought he was interesting on antibiotics and proteins and the way AI work. But maybe if you stand up at a Hustings and Exeter and start banging on about artificial intelligence research into proteins, you you lose the audience. Yeah, but maybe, maybe if Keir Starmer, having said he wants to make growth the centerpiece of his strategy, if he actually said, then went on to develop that, and this is where that would relate to this whole kind of amazing new world of opportunities. And don't forget Harold Wilson, you know, the white heat, the technological revolution. I mean, he, you know, it's been done before, rhetorically yeah 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 exactly and it's a really good and it really worked for wilson didn't it the one yeah. thing we all remember about him more than 50 years later is the white heat of technology we remember the open university open university and the pipe the pipe we do remember the pipe. and the gannix code <laughs> right okay on that i think thank you very much and that's it from me and from me bye-bye all the best <laughs>